Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Mara Walsh, and I am your host today. I'm so excited to be hosting this virtual tour this week, which highlights a historic region in my own country. Even though San Diego is more than 2,500 miles from where I live, it is still nice to share some of the US with all of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm very happy to be able to continue bringing these virtual tours and this experience to you via Zoom and Facebook Live. I'm gonna share a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. As I said, my name is Mara Walsh. I am in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York. This is the Eastern time zone. I mention that because you can always convert the time if you use New York or Philadelphia, when you see the time that our virtual tours are being played and you can figure out what time it is in your local region. In fact, in San Diego right now, we're at four o'clock um, because they are on Pacific time. As you may know by now, when we're not traveling virtually, I host groups on physical tours, as well as help others plan their own family vacations and group vacations. My tours are mainly adult only and open to all women and men. My summer trips are for all ages, teens through senior citizens. And if you wanna follow our physical tours, please join my private Facebook group, which is Girl Travel Tours, where you can travel right along with our groups from your mobile device. I am off tomorrow on a tour. So if you wanna follow me through the Netherlands and Brussels on a river cruise, um, join our group and you can follow along. When COVID struck, we were unable to travel physically and I started traveling with my tour guide friends virtually. And thankfully these virtual tour presentations have helped many tour directors earn some much needed income and have kept the excitement of travel alive for many travel group participants and many of you. So they've served both purposes quite well. We've done more than 75 virtual tours so far. The recordings are all available on girltraveltours.com, my YouTube channel and Facebook feed. We have some more tours planned for this coming year. Right now, <clears throat> excuse me, oh my. I'm still uh, a little bit sick from, from getting over um, being sick with COVID. So I'm sorry, I'm coughing up a storm here. Um, right now we have one that can be registered for, and that tour is um, to Madrid. And we're doing that in May, on May 11th. Um, I will be traveling for the next week, as I said, so I'll skip that week um, and I encourage everybody to go back to the recordings that you may have missed and pick up one or two and enjoy them while I'm away. Uh, let's review a few ways you can interact with us during this event. Feel free to ask questions about the tour, about the tour guide, or my travel program using the Q&A link and we'll deal with those questions live after the presentation. You can also chat um, if you have a question directly for me, and I'll do my best to answer it during the presentation. And as you know, I always like to throw up an interactive poll, which um, gives us an understanding of what your connection is with the region. So what's your connection to the San Diego's historic gas, light, gas lamp quarters? I have been and loved it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I have no set plans, but I'm interested in the location, or I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. So I'm gonna let it go for a minute or two. Um, it looks like we have about 65% of the people who have um, who are answering so far. And it's, it's actually interesting to me, there's so many people that have been, um, I'm one of those people, but it's been many, many years since I've been there. So I probably need to go back and revisit this region. Um, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. It looks like about 40% of the people have been and of course loved it. Uh, very small percent uh, have a trip booked. I hope that changes after um, we go through this presentation with Jamie. And um, we have a lot of people with no set plans, but they're interested in the location. So very interesting, about 40% have been and loved it. I'm, I'm stopping sharing right now. And if the poll doesn't uh, pop down for you, you might have to hit the top button so that it goes away from your screen. 
Today's tour and all of our tours are set for 90 minutes plus a Q&A. So I hope you're ready for the presentation. And as you know, a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour guide. And we have a very experienced tour guide with us today that wears many hats. Jamie not only acts as a guide in the Gas Lamp Quarter, but she works for the Gas Lamp Quarter Historic Foundation. So tonight, Jamie has pledged that all the proceeds of this virtual tour are going directly to the foundation. I'll share with you via chat and during the Q&A how you can leave a donation. If you appreciate this presentation and our guide's knowledge, feel free to drop a tip or donation and it will go directly to the Gas Lamp Foundation once collected minus the Zoom operating expenses. So today, I want to welcome Jamie to join us. Hello and welcome, Jamie. Feel free to come on your video and take the controls and share your screen. And we're ready to see the historic region of San Diego. All right, hello everybody. Mary, can you hear me okay? We, you are, you're good, at, you're good to go, Jamie, thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and thank you all so much for spending some of your time with me from wherever you are. Um, as Mara said, my name is Jamie. Um, I am born and raised and still living in my favorite city, San Diego, California. Um, I also love history. Um, I do have a BA in history and I am currently completing my um, certificate of Specialization in Kumeyaay Native American Studies. Um, currently, I work for the Gas Lamp Quarter Historical Foundation, and um, it is a nonprofit. Our mission is to preserve and protect the history, architecture, and culture of San Diego's historic downtown Gas Lamp Quarter. One of the hats that I wear for the foundation is a tour guide. Um, so I am going to take you guys around on a historic tour of the downtown district. But first, um, if you don't know, this is where we are located on the globe. Um, we are in North America, in Southern California. We are about 118 miles south of Los Angeles and only about 15 miles from the US-Mexico border. Um, we are nicknamed America's finest city. And this was probably a bit of a marketing slogan when it was first coined, but we do have near perfect weather every single day year round. Um, and what I love about living here is that the city is perfectly situated between beautiful beaches, mountains, desert, forests. So we have a little something for everyone uh, when you come visit. You could visit Balboa Park, which is in the middle of the city. Um, locals and tourists enjoy a nice walk year round. And this is where you can find numerous museums, um, the world famous San Diego Zoo, uh, and fun fact, it's actually bigger than Central Park, um, Manhattan, by close to double the acreage. It is also home to the Old Globe Theater, so you can see a lot of classic plays. In the summer, they have a Shakespeare Fest, so if that is your cup of tea, I would definitely put that on your list. It is a very historic theater. Um, we do experience four seasons in the county, so not too much the city, but in San Diego County, we do experience four seasons um, year round, or, uh, year round and uh, we do in the mountains, you can experience snow. Um, in the deserts, you can also experience some colder weather. Um, also, we have beautiful fall foliage up in the mountains. And um, in December, it's also nice to, to go up to the Cuyamaca Mountains and spend a little time. It feels very Christmassy when we have some snow on the ground in San Diego. Um, you can tell a true San Diegan on the days when we do get a snow, a snow day, which is very rare for um, San Diego, but um, people in the mountains, they do get a snow day and you'll see the entire city sort of crowd the streets up to the mountains to sled, um, or just get a hot cup of cocoa and be in the ambiance of winter. 
We are, of course, famous for our beaches. We have miles and miles of beautiful beaches in San Diego. Um, you can learn how to surf. You can catch a sunset. You can have a picnic. Um, this is mostly what people come to our city for, is to experience the beaches. Um, we're also famous for Comic-Con. Um, thank my husband for these beautiful photos as he was doing media work. Um, but we're famous for Comic-Con. Uh, they come here in July. I believe they are going to start up again after our, uh, COVID shut them down for a couple years. Um, we are famous for having this convention where everyone from around the world comes to see their favorite superheroes, um, even dress up like their favorite superheroes. And you can also see some celebrities as well. Um, I have a few fun facts about San Diego prepared. Um, some things that you might not know. Um, we are the only place in the world where you can find the Torrey Pine. It's the rarest pine tree in the United States. It only grows in the Torrey Pine State Reserve um, or the beachside town of Del Mar in the northern part of the county and two islands off the coast of Southern California. We are where the California burrito originated. Don't let anyone from LA tell you otherwise. Um, this was created in San Diego. Um, it's one of our famous dishes, the California burrito, where you put French fries inside of a carne asada burrito. Um, while we're on the subject of food, in San Diego, the cuisine that we are known for is Mexican food. Um, you could get some carne asada fries, which is my favorite dish. Um, it's like having nachos with guacamole and, and uh, salsa and cheese and sour cream, but instead of the chips, you put um, French fries and they have to be a certain kind. The small crispy ones are usually the best. Um, also, this is where you can get really good fish tacos since we're so close to Baja, California. Um, there are tons of places for Mexican food that you, where you can go in San Diego. Um, it's said that San Diegans, we don't have a favorite taco shop. We have a taco shop for each of our favorite dishes. So for example, I would probably go to Taco Salsa in my neighborhood for um, carne asada tacos. Um, I would go to a place, uh, gosh, there's just so many. Uh, probably Lucha Libre for their surf and turf burrito. So um, this place that I'm showing you, uh, Las Cuatro Milpas, is a famous place located in Barrio Logan. Um, it's kind of the gold standard for Mexican cuisine. Um, I have to confess, I've never actually been there myself because every time I do try to go, the line is out the door. Um, everyone raves about it. And it's also very historic. I believe it is owned by the Estadio family a very prominent California family in San Diego. Um, also, you can get really good Filipino food here in San Diego. Um, the best place to go would probably be my mom's house, but since we all can't fit in there, um, a good second is probably Tita's Kitchenette located in South San Diego. Um, it's inexpensive and the food is, is delicious and top notch. Um, so, definitely check that out when you come down here. Get your fill of Mexican food, have some Filipino food. We have some of the best in the country. Um, if you are looking for more of a variety of Asian cuisine, you would head to Convoy, um, which is in central San Diego, uh, kind of off the beaten path for some tourists, um, but you can find anything there from boba to sushi to yakitori to dim sum um, pho you can find all of that there that is where we go for the best asian cuisine in san diego um, we're also known for our wood fire pizza which surprised me as well but um, san diego is known for our wood fire pizza and also um, our micro breweries we have almost 150 across the county um, this one is new it's Rincon. Um, and they have really, if, if you are into beer, they definitely have uh, some to satisfy everyone's beer palates. 
Um, also in San Diego, we are known for our weather, as I mentioned, and um, a great experience you can have all over the county is um, dining rooftop because the weather is pretty much good all year round. Um, this is a rooftop bar in the historic gas lamp quarter San Diego called Rustic Root. And as you could see from the view, the buildings in front of you, every single one of them are over 100 years old and they're historic. Um, so while you can catch views of the beaches, um, the overview of the city, um, nightlife, I think to me in the gas lamp, um, the view of the historic buildings is probably the most unique. So to round out our talk about food, because we have a lot of good food in San Diego and I could probably do a whole presentation on just the food that we offer here, a whole food tour. Um, but to round it out, another fun fact about San Diego is that we were once the, cap the tuna capital of the world from 1930 to about 1970s. Um, this monument that you guys see on the right-hand side of the screen, um, that is an ode to the tuna fishermen who built a lot of San Diego um, in the 1930s to 1970s. Uh, another fun fact, um, full of them, <laughs> uh, another one is that San Diego has ties to the Wizard of Oz. So if you are a fan of the Wizard of Oz, make your way over to Coronado Island and you can see the historic home that Frank L. Baum vacationed in uh, while he wrote many of the books in the Wizard of Oz series. And from one of the rooms up there where he was writing the Wizard of Oz, he had a view of the Hotel del Coronado, a very historic hotel built in the late 1800s. Um, and it was said that this was his inspiration for the Emerald City in his books, The Wizard of Oz. Um, we do have a town dog. So some, a lot of people don't know that about us, but we do have an official town dog. His name is Bum the Dog. He came to San Diego in the late 1890s as a stowaway on a ship um, from San Francisco. Um, he liked it so much that he stayed and he was sort of known to go about on all of his adventures. In the Victorian era, it was very expensive uh, to own a pet. So the city or uh, Newtown San Diego, as it was known then, just took care of him. Um, they, he ate at all the best restaurants. Um, if he ate at your restaurant, there would be a sign on your restaurant that said, Bum Eats Here. So it was sort of like a Michelin star. Uh, if you see from this, photo he's missing part of his right paw um, he got into a fight with another dog on the train tracks the train hit them uh, the other dog died but bum survived uh, and he always was sort of had that limp arm um, which i guess aided him in um, fights that he would have so he was known to defend himself with this little club arm um, when he passed away the children of san diego um, put all their pennies together to give him a proper burial um, so now we are going to delve into the history of San Diego so you can get a sense of where our downtown sort of comes into play. Uh, we are going to start from the very beginning to give you um, sort of a historical timeline. Um, San Diego is Mat Kumeyaay, which means Kumeyaay land. Um, this region is the ancestral homeland of the Kumeyaay people who have been here since the beginning and they have cared for this land, um, their ancestral territory. Um, and it spans San Diego County, Imperial County, Northern and Northern Baja California, Mexico. So you can kind of see of the map um, where their ancestral land spans from. Many of the places in San Diego do bear um, some Kumeyaay names. Poway, which is a suburb um, of San Diego, um, what is originally called Poway, which um, is a place where you could find arrowheads. Um, Hamul, which is in East County, Southeast County, San Diego, that means sweet water. And the areas around there are actually named Sweetwater. The street that I live off, um, leave, live off of is uh, Sweetwater Road. Um, there's also the mountains that I talked a little bit about earlier in the presentation, um, the Cuyamaca Mountains. It is sort of a Spanish, uh, kind of messed it up. It's, it's actually, Equiamak, which means um, place behind the clouds or place where it rains. 
Um, so San Diego is obviously not a Kumeyaay name. It is a Spanish name. It's named after St. Didicus. The first um, Spaniards that made a settlement here uh, was a viceroy with um, Father Unipro Serra, and they established 21 missions um, in Alta, California. Um, there, the Spanish timeline went until the mid 1800s. And um, in 1821, Mexico gained independence from Spain and San Diego became part of Mexico. All the missions were secularized. The land was, and the land was being divided into ranchos. Uh, these photos that I have here, they are from um, Old Town San Diego which um, is a great place to visit uh, for really good Mexican food, um, a lot of history. It has uh, one of the most haunted houses in America there, the Whaley House, uh, but it's also a really good place to experience um, old San Diego's Mexican culture um, and sort of a, a lot of different types of cuisines there as well. So this is where downtown San Diego sort of comes into play. So now that you have a timeline of our history, um, California became a state in 1850. Um, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848, um, all of this land was ceded to the Americans. Um, so everyone in California became a Mexican citizen, or I'm sorry, a um, US citizen. Um, Historically, they called the area of downtown San Diego Newtown to differentiate it from Old Town. They were very creative in those days. Um, this is a map of where we are in San Diego. Um, so as you can see, we're across the bay from Coronado. Um, one of the reasons that they decided to move um, the, the sort of the center of the city to this area is because it, of its location by the bay. Um, so there was a man named William Heath Davis. Um, he came to San Diego um, from the Kingdom of Hawaii. He was born there in 1822. Um, he was the son of a Boston ship trader and his grandmother was part of King Kamehameha's royal court. Um, so he had uh, royal blood and his uh, father, I believe, was also a governor of Oahu. Um, he came to California, first to San Francisco, um, but he was married to a very prominent uh, uh, member of the Estadillo family and his uncle um, granted him some land in San Diego. So he decided to build a new town. He was surveying with a man named Andrew Gray and um, they sort of were talking and they said, you know, why is the center of San Diego inland? Because Old Town, um, if you landed in the bay, you would have to trek all of your goods inland, um, which is a good, uh, off top of my head, probably 20 mile trek inland. Um, so he and Andrew Gray decided, you know, we should move the center of Newtown San Diego closer to the bay. So um, as he was building Newtown San Diego, uh, there was a ship with 10 to 12 of these prefabricated um, salt box style homes that were making their way to San Francisco to serve as housing for the 49ers. In 1849, gold was discovered in California and lots of people rushed to California um, to sort of make it big. Um, well, by 1850, which is when this house was made, um, it was a little too late. Um, so William Heath, William Heath Davis bought the entire ship. That's how rich he was. And he sent this ship down to San Diego with the houses on it. Um, originally, this, these houses were uh, made in Portland, Maine. Um, they are salt box style, which I mentioned. Um, a lot of them were the same as this, sort of the um, prefabricated style. One of them was a little bit bigger and that's where William Heath Davis lived while he was in San Diego. Um, this house served many purposes uh, throughout its life. It is the last house in this shipment um, that is, or from that shipment, it's the last one still standing. Um, here it is today. It is now the headquarters for the Gas Sump Quarter Historical Foundation. 
Um, so to give you kind of a sense of where we are, um, this is a map of the gas or kind of zoomed in on the gas lamp quarter. Um, you could see to the east, there's East Village. Um, and then to the west, we have the Bay, the Convention Center, um, and we're sort of in the middle there. So we're gonna use this map as we go throughout our um, trek in the historic gas lamp quarter. Um, so the house was used for numerous purposes and that's sort of why it uh, became, or it lasted um, 172 years. So remember it was built in 1850 um, and it was first used as a army barracks for um, pre-Civil War soldiers. Um, in 1850, there was a lot of unrest. So a lot of people did not want to move to San Diego, Newtown, San Diego. Mr. Davis, unfortunately, had a lot of trouble trying to get settlers to come to Newtown. Um, so the army used this house uh, while they were stationed here. Um, so you could see some of the artifacts. This is the military hall inside of the Davis Horton house. Um, we know of two generals who went on, or two soldiers who went on to become generals in the Civil War. Uh, we have on the left-hand side, General McGruger, who fought on behalf of the Confederacy, and Nathaniel Lyons, who fought on behalf of the, um, the Union. General Lyons, um, there is a valley in the East County of San Diego named after him because he was responsible for charting um, the back country of East County, so they named the valley after him. Um, he was also the first Union general to die in the Civil War. Um, once the soldiers moved out, um, Mr. Davis went back to San Francisco because he suffered a lot of losses to his assets there. Uh, most of his, or his house and most of his assets were in San Francisco. Um, and so he left after a fire um, burned down some of his house. He went back there and had to abandon Newtown San Diego. So it sat there um, with nothing but rabbits and dust, they said, uh, for almost 17 years. This man came 17 years later. His name was Alonzo Erastus, Erastus Horton. Um, he came from the East Coast um, and he first went to um, Wisconsin and established a town there called Hortonville. Um, had about 2,000 people. To this day, it still has about the same. Um, I believe it's it's a little west of Green Bay. I, I could be wrong on that, but um, it's a it's a small town uh, in Wisconsin. He, like many other people, saw the lure of gold in California, and so he came west to California. Um, he first went to San Francisco and he ran a, a goods supply store. Uh, he made a lot of money there. Um, and then he had heard about San Diego from his acquaintance, uh, William Heath Davis, who called it heaven on earth. Um, well, he made his way down to check it out. Um, and I should mention that Alonzo Wharton actually did have a bit of cough. Um, in, in those days, uh, we might we might be able to relate to this, but uh, in those days when you had sort of a cough, tuberculosis was very rampant. So they advised him to go west for his health. Um, that's where he ended up in San Francisco. Then he came down to San Diego. Miraculously, they say his cough disappeared. Um, and that's why he called it heaven on earth and decided to stay. Um, Alonzo Horton, he, is responsible for building a lot of Newtown San Diego. Um, and he lived in the Davis Horton house for a couple years uh, with his third slash fourth or third slash fourth wife, depending on who you ask. Mr. Alonzo Horton was known to have uh, three wives that he admitted to, um, but five, uh, if you asked his great nieces and nephews, he did not have any descendants, any children. Um, but he lived with Sarah Babe Horton in the Davis Horton house. Um, and he built most of Sandy or downtown San Diego during that time. Um, while he lived in the Davis Horton house, he only lived there for a couple years. So this is the upstairs bedroom, which we attribute to be the Horton bedroom because of that marble fireplace that you guys see on the left. Uh, the marble fireplace is very expensive, of course, and that is um, the only resident to live in that house um, to be able to afford that would have been Alonzo Horton. 
Um, he didn't stay while he was being very, you know, while he was uh, gaining success in building Newtown. Um, he built five other mansions in the city of San Diego and moved into each of the mansions, the more successful he got. Um, all of the mansions are now torn down. Um, it's just the little Davis Horton house that he lived in for two years um, that is still standing. You'll notice the wallpaper um, throughout the house. The, the wallpaper of the house is not original. They had to comb through 17 layers to get to the original um, design of the wallpaper. Um, but a lot of the elaborate wallpaper is put up in the, the Horton bedroom. Um, in the Victorian era, the wallpaper to get that beautiful green color, it was made out of arsenic. So as a person that works in the house, I'm thankful that that is not the original wallpaper. Um, so when Alonzo Horton moved out, a lady named Anna Shepper moved in and she ran the Davis Horton house as a um, county hospital, the first county hospital in Newtown, San Diego. Now, by this time, the house had been moved from its original spot. It was originally closer to the Bayonne State Market, and then it was moved to 11th and K, where Petco Park now sits, um, to become San Diego's first county hospital. Um, Anna Shepard bought the house for $1,000 and contracted with the city to take care of San Diego's poorest patients for $1 a day per patient. Um, on average, she had about eight patients a day, um, but there's a record of her having up to 19 patients in one day. Um, this is a close up of some of the medical supplies that she would have used in the house. You can see on the right that there's a um, medical case from the 1800s. A lot of it was tonics, mostly filled with alcohol. Um, she did care for a lot of cuts and bruises, a uh, few minor ailments, and unfortunately, tuberculosis uh, was a killer in those days, which couldn't really do much for people but make them feel comfortable. This is a photo of Anna here. Um, she was not an experienced nurse, uh, but she was very good at taking care of people. Um, and she worked really, really hard. She was also a single, single mother, an immigrant from Germany. She had a team of young ladies that she hired on with her um, to help care for San Diego's um, poorest patients. Um, as the city, as uh, more people started sort of following suit with Anna and contracting to house patients in their homes, um, they kind of docked her pay. Um, and so went from a dollar to maybe 40 cents to 30 cents. And so Anna, after eight years, um, decided to sell the house and um, she moved on to other ventures. The next people to move into the Davis Horton house um, was a German immigrant couple named Henry and Lena Lohmann. Um, they rented to a lot of young German soldiers. Um, now this is about in the early 1900s. Um, they rented to a lot of young German soldiers before World War I. Um, one of them happened to be something that um, not any of them maybe expected. Um, he turned out to be a spy for Germany and he used the attic in the Davis Horton house to spy on ships in our harbor. Um, now it was located on 11th and K, which was very close to the, the harbor. You had a good view of where you could see some of our ships there. So he would um, write some of that information down, send it on to Germany. And he'd also stir up trouble down in the bay to halt production. Well, he was found out um, and they arrested him and deported him. Uh, Mr. Carl Offer, the spy from Germany, um, and the Lomans, so the couple that owned the house, they were not implicated um, because they said that they didn't know anything about his whereabouts or what he did. Um, but a very mysterious thing is Lena um, changed her name from Lena Loman to Linda Loman to sound less German. They did not have any children of their own. They were an older couple, um, but they did adopt a young boy off the streets. There he is right there holding the first grade sign. His name was George Deo. He was abandoned by his uh, mother, father, and his grandmother. And so he was begging. Um, so they took him in and they raised him in the house as their own. Um, this is a photo of George attending, attending one of the first schools in downtown San Diego, the B Street School in 1902. Um, George, he eventually inherited the house from his adoptive grandparents. Now this is a photo of his study. It's one of the more modern um, 
rooms in the Davis Horton house. And um, it's, it's left exactly as George uh, sort of left it. A lot of that belonged to him, a lot of the artifacts in there. Um, George, uh, he was very successful in his endeavors. He had a quite, quite he was comfortable, um, but he always kept the door to his study locked and no one was allowed to go in there. He was running it. He took after his parents and ran the house as a boarding house. No one was allowed to go in this room. Um, he said it was because he kept the ashes of his adoptive parents in the room, so it was sacred. Um, when the room was finally unlocked after George um, sold it to the city, um, they found $5,000 worth of solid gold and a working whiskey still in the room, which meant that George and his adoptive father, Henry, were moonshiners during prohibition. Um, this is a photo of George receiving a plaque from the mayor of San Diego in the 70s uh, to designate the house as historic. Um, even throughout the hospital era, the 1950s and 60s when George lived in the house, he did not add any modern conveniences to this Victorian prefabricated home. So a lot of the boarders and even George himself had no running water or electricity until, um, actually they didn't have any. When the house was used as a museum in 1981, that is when electricity um, was installed in the house um, and running water we have in our offices. So not in the historic part of the home. One of the questions that I get um, a lot, probably the first one that people ask me is, is the house haunted? Um, I like to have people sort of make up their own mind because it really depends on what you believe is haunted, what you believe ghosts and spirits are. Um, we do have some tours that you can find out. We have virtual ones. So from ever, wherever you guys are, you can join us. Or we also do some physical ones. Uh, that picture in the corner is me and our lovely historian, Sandy Wilhoyt, conducting a candlelight tour and a paranormal investigation. Um, we do have some findings from numerous, numerous groups, some photos, which you can see on our website. Um, but it is a lot of fun to sort of figure it out on your own. Um, some of the tales that sort of are associated with the house is um, the a lady in black that likes to hang out on the top of the stairs. Um, so she is a lady that wears a beautiful black Victorian dress and sort of stares at people from down the stairs. Um, some people have said that, or there was a group that came in and said um, they were following a docent who, or who they thought was a docent dressed in a black dress up the stairs, um, only to ask her a question and have her disappear. Um, a lot of people say that she often peers out the window at them. Um, some people say that it might be Anna Shepper herself, the nurse that ran the Horton House uh, as a hospital. She was known to wear a black dress, but she also did have an apron on most of the time. Um, sometimes when people talk about this lady in black, she is a very fancy dressed woman. Uh, we're not really sure where that story came from. The house is um, mostly for a maybe middle class to upper middle class family. Um, so they probably wouldn't be dressed in that fancy of an attire, but she is one of the more um, popular ghosts that people uh, like to talk about when they come experience things in the house. The little cat that you see on the um, corner is named Midnight. Um, she's a feral cat. We have three, or we had three, now we have two um, kitties that like to call the Gas Lamp Museum home. Um, it's not our choice, we, we take care of them, but um, it is their choice that they like to stay there. Um, so they, they kind of uh, stir up a little bit of folklore that with the um, museum being haunted as well. Sometimes at night when I walk past the museum, I see a lot of people trying to pet her and swear that she is a, a witch that guards the house or, or anything else that, that people can think of. Um, if you have had an experience in the house, we do like people to write it down in our ghost book. Um, so what we do with this is we sort of keep it on file um, and we will tell about it in some of our uh, ghostly tales experiences. We'll read straight from the book. Um, and we also have some recordings of people telling about their experiences as you walk through the house. Um, so if you wanted to add an element of spookiness to your historic tour um, while you tour the house, um, 
definitely check out our, our spooky book. Um, and also you can, you can see a lot of people um, tell about their experiences online as well. I've, I've seen numerous websites and, and YouTube videos uh, with, of people claiming they've experienced something in the Davis Horton house. And I know you guys are all thinking, um, you, you're gonna ask me if I have experienced anything because that's always the next question that comes next. Um, I, I would like to say maybe. Um, I do hear things sometimes, but I always like to tell people to keep in mind that the house is located in a very noisy part of downtown. Um, so maybe that's what I'm hearing. Um, sometimes you see light effects. It's a very old Victorian house. Um, as I said, I'll repeat again, I'd like people to make their own assumptions. So you're gonna have to come visit us. Um, now we are going to take a tour around the historic gas lamp quarter. And I'm gonna show you some of the buildings that um, sprung up during Horton's day, um, Horton's edition, uh, Newtown San Diego, and what sort of made Newtown what it is today. Uh, the, first, the first building here is the Callan Hotel built in 1878. It was owned by a man named Tillman Burns. Tillman Burns, um, he owned a couple saloons in San Diego, but this one was uh, situated right in Newtown. Um, there were a lot of saloons that eventually popped up in Newtown. It actually, we'll talk a little bit about how it devolved into a, um, a red light district. Um, during Till's time, he did have a lot of competition from other saloons. So he had to have sort of a gimmick um, to attract people to come in. He was famous for having a menagerie, uh, which we kind of joke is the beginnings of the San Diego Zoo, but historically it wasn't. Uh, but Till was known to house a one-armed monkey, an anteater, tarantulas, um, numerous exotic animals and curiosities in his um, saloon. He was also known to have a bear named Bruin. Um, they didn't have a lot of rules for animals in those days, so Till kept Bruin in a cage right outside of his saloon. And one day, a constable who was drunk thought it would be really funny to stick his face inside the cage of Bruin. Bruin didn't like that very much. Um, he got really annoyed and he bit a piece of this guy's face off. So we ran down to City Hall, which I will show you guys as well. And he complained to the judge about his face. And the judge said, well, if you are dumb enough to stick your face inside the cage of a bear, I can't help you. So they threw the case out. Um, but what it did was it sort of shed light on um, Tillman, Tillman Burns saloon and the complaints that people were sort of having about it. So they served him a cease and desist and ordered him to close um, and release all the animals. And that's exactly what he did. He was not very happy, so he closed and he released all the animals out into the gas plant or to, into Newtown. Um, so that must have been a very crazy day, um, I'm sure, when that happened. Um, you'll see here a little, a little plaque. Um, so if the building is historic, it'll have this a little plaque that looks just like this. Uh, when Tillman Burns moved out, um, a Japanese couple um, called the Nippon Company ran this as a import export business of Asian goods. Um, unfortunately, when, the, when World War II came around, they were sent to internment camps. They never got their business back. Um, and you'll see the kanji is sort of an ode to that couple. The kanji on the Catlin Hotel sign is an ode to the couple um, and also to the Asian district. Um, so next to the gas lamp quarter, which we know Newtown as today, um, sits the Asian thematic district. And it is historically San Diego's Chinatown. Um, we don't have a Chinatown like New York or San Francisco. Um, unfortunately, it was all sort of broken up as the years uh, went by, but this is where um, many Chinese immigrants came to San Diego um, to make a new life in new um, close to Newtown San Diego. So from third to about sixth avenues, um, I'm sorry, third to about fourth avenues is where you'll see a lot of um, buildings that have Asian influence. This building here is the Nanking Cafe, and it was built in 1911. Um, it is owned by the Wong family to this day. They 
took um, ownership of the building in 19, in the 1920s. Um, they still own it and it has continuous, continuously been an Asian restaurant. Um, it's under new ownership today. This is a very recent photo. Um, so we will see what they're going to open if they're gonna still stay with that um, theme. Next to it, um, so this is a little bit of details of the Nanking building. This is considered modern Victorian architecture. Next to it is the Manila Cafe. Um, it was built a year later, and um, it also shows some of the Asian influence that was very popular during the Victorian era. The East was opening up to the West, um, so it was very fashionable to have Asian architecture or goods. Um, the red tiles that you see at the top, this kind of gives you a, a sense of how big the Manila Cafe is. Um, the tiles that you see at the top are adobe tiles. So a lot of the materials in, San, in downtown San Diego were all shipped in from the East Coast. Um, there was not a lot of materials to build American style buildings. So a lot of them were shipped in from the East Coast. Um, these adobe tiles, a lot of the buildings from old San Diego are made out of adobe. Um, so that should, sort of shows that we were veering away from importing everything and starting to become our own city using materials made here. Um, a little bit down the street, um, I'll give you guys a map of where we are once we sort of veer away from the house. Um, we are still close to where the Davis Horton house is. We're just around the corner. Um, this is the Grand Pacific building. It's a classic Victorian building. Um, one of the only ones that's in its original spot. So a lot of the buildings in the gas lamp quarter were moved. Um, this one is in its original spot. It was built in 1887. Uh, it did house numerous businesses um, and hotels, but it was famous for being the helping hand mission in the 1890s. Um, this was sort of a time, San Diego, downtown San Diego experienced a lot of booms and busts. So a lot of people would flood in, um, the real estate would go down, people would move out, and then they would come back in. Um, Horton was a very big, um, I guess cheerleader, you could say, of, of the railroad coming to San Diego. So he promised that the railroad would come. Um, he invested a lot of money in it. And so um, people started to come to San Diego to settle. A lot of the Chinese immigrants came to help build the railroad. Um, and so that this was built in sort of that boom era. Um, it was famous for being the helping hand mission. Um, the area sort of fell into a red light district. Um, a lot of the poorer people um, lived in Newtown as more of the prominent citizens moved to other parts of the city. Um, and it was a place where all people could come um, who were sick um, or destitute. Um, and it was had a floor specifically devoted um, to women and for mothers. Um, it did have a Sunday school as well. And um, it became the Children's Memorial Hospital and it stayed there um, until 1920. There are some of the details of the building here. Um, it is classic Victorian architecture, one of the more uh, prominent buildings in the gas lamp. And now it's a, um, a uh, steakhouse. Um, so you could see a lot of the businesses in the gas lamp quarter sort of are being repurposed for different things to save all the um, history. The next building we're going to talk about is the Gesto building. So we are still not too far from the um, Davis Horton house, just up the block. The Begesto building um, was also built during the boom and it served as um, a mini mall of sorts. So if you wanted to go shopping in the Victorian era, this is where you would go. Um, they had milliners and hat makers, or milliners, they had uh, cobblers um, and the tops were office, the top uh, floor was offices for um, a lot of architects and bankers. Uh, that's a detail of the Begesto building there. Um, one thing about our, our uh, Victorian architecture is that they loved everything to be detailed and symmetrical. So that's how you can kind of tell um, that it's classic Victorian. Um, right across the street from the Begesto building is the McGriff Block building. Uh, this was built in 1887 and it was used as a hotel. 
um, numerous different hotels and offices. Um, but it is really famous for being um, the Ferris and Ferris drugstore, one of the first drugstores, overnight drugstores in San Diego from 1903 to 1984. Um, it was also one of the last places that you could buy live leeches. Um, so say you got into a fight and um, you needed to clear up some of the bruises, you can just go over to the Ferris and Ferris and buy some leeches from Dr. Peck. Um, Dr. Peck was the overnight druggist at the Ferris and Ferris drugstore. Um, and what was great about Ferris and Ferris was they could deliver your drugs to you. He had his son helping him um, deliver drugs to people in Newtown. Um, and he would go on his bike and deliver it to anybody who needed um, at 24 hours a day. And um, this young man's name was Eldridge. And Eldridge, um, Dr. Peck hoped that Eldridge would follow in his footsteps and also become a pharmacist as well. But Eldridge had other plans. Um, he wanted to become an actor and he changed his name to Gregory. Um, so Gregory Peck um, worked at the overnight drugstore in San Diego. He is a San Diego boy born and raised in La Jolla. Here's a little bit of some of the details of the McGurk Block building. You could see the beautiful balconies. Um, and also this is the corner where you could see one of the gas lamps in the district. Um, right on the other side of the McGurk Block building is the IOOF building built in 1882. The IOOF stands for the Independent Order of the Odd Fellows, which is a fraternal order like the Freemasons. In fact, they shared this building um, until 1910 um, when the Freemasons got their own building, which is um, now the Scottish Rite Center in Mission Valley. Um, rumor has it, well, it took them 10 years to build. We'll say that first. It took them 10 years to build. Um, they ran out of materials and money. When they finally laid the cornerstone, it um, had a casket, which is a very independent or of the odd fellows thing to do. And it had a lot of artifacts um, and also a stone from Solomon's temple. Um, they are one of the first fraternal orders to allow women to join as well. Uh, the rumor has it of this building is that King Kalakaua from the Kingdom of Hawaii was on his world tour and he stopped in San Diego, um, went to the IOF building and um, they had a parade for him because he was a Freemason. Well, he stood or he sat in one of those windows there um, and he happened to catch a cold. And by the time he went to San Francisco, he died of pneumonia. That is the rumor for this building here. Um, this is a little bit of detail of the IOF building if you would, if you were staring at it straight on. So here is a map of where we are now. The first red dot um, in the middle of the, where it says gas lamp where at the top, that is where the Davis Horton house is on 4th and Island. We sort of turned on to 5th and now we're at the corner of 5th and Market. Um, and that is where most of the buildings that I talked about are now. Um, we are going to go up the street just a little bit to the Yuma building. The Yuma building is one of the most beautiful buildings in the gas lamp quarter. As you can see on the right hand side, that is the McGurk block. So right next to it is the Yuma building. Uh, the Yuma building is one of the first brick structures built in downtown San Diego. Um, the name Yuma is not, or uh, where it got its name to me is not terribly interesting. Um, but it was uh, commissioned for a man named Captain Wilcox, who was um, given the task of charting our false bay, which we now call Mission Bay. Um, so he was given this building as a place to live. Um, he was from Yuma and he dragged his wife out to San Diego. Um, she finished the build or having the commissioning the building. Um, it is a beautiful townhouse inside. Uh, Mr. Wilcox died before the completion of the building um, and Mrs. Wilcox eventually went back to Yuma. Um, so that's where the name comes from, but its notoriety comes from the early 1900s during the Great Raid of 1912. Um, so here's a little bit of detail of the top of the Yuma building. You could see the two spurs up top there. Um, so the great, so in the early 1900s, the gas lamp or the new town, as it was called then, sort of fell into a red light district, which they named the Stingery, because it was easier to get stung by vice 
um, in the stingery district than it was to get stung by vice in the with the many stingrays in our bay. Um, so there were numerous saloons, numerous brothels that you could um, enjoy if you were coming to the red light district in San Diego. It was said that we rivaled the Barbary Coast of San Francisco. Um, so the Yuma building um, during the Great Raid of 1912, this is the interior that you guys could see if you're looking out. This sign says um, you are responsible for your own safety um, because it was a very dangerous area during that time. Um, raids happened all the time in the red light district in the stingery, um, but a lot of the times the madams or the saloon keepers would get sort of a warning. Um, in this day in November of 1912, no one was warned and a huge raid took place um, in the stingery, AKA Newtown. Um, they arrested 138 women of the night. They lined them all up in front of the Yuma building and they were given two choices. Um, the first one was you could take a ticket, march on down to the train station, take a ticket and get out of the city. Um, the second one was if you work for us, we'll, give, we'll get you back on your feet and you can sort of leave that life behind. 106 36, 136 women chose to take that ticket out of town. And of course they weren't stupid. Um, the city was paying for it. So they bought a round trip ticket. A lot of them left the city for a while. And once sort of people started forgetting about that whole fiasco, a lot of them came back. Uh, but instead of being sort of condensed into the red light district, they sort of spread throughout the city. Um, the two ladies that took the city up on their offer, one of them, um, was deemed insane and the other lady changed her mind and nobody knew, knows what happened to them after that. Um, the reason they were wanting to clean the district up is because they were getting ready for the Panama Exposition, uh, which is now where Balboa Park is located. So a lot of those buildings um, were for the Panama Exposition, the Panama Canal was opening. Um, and when you invite a lot of dignitaries and royalty to your city, you don't want them to see your red light district. And that's what prompted them to do the great raid of 1912. So now we are going to go a little bit up the street on fifth and we are going to see San Diego's old city hall. Um, the old city hall of San Diego was built during the boom time, the 1890s. Um, and it was first started off as um, one story building and then they moved all of the city records into this building. Um, the rumor has it that in the dead of the night, the records were stolen from Old Town San Diego. So remember, we talked that there was a lot of resistance from people in Old Town not wanting to come to Newtown. Um, but in the dead of the night, the city records were stolen and brought to the old city hall. And that sort of forced a lot of people from Old Town to move into Newtown. Um, and it made Newtown the center of the city. The other floors were built. Um, eventually, they moved the um, county jail in there, the police headquarters, and the San Diego Library, um, which was uh, seen over by Alonzo Horton's fifth wife, um, Lydia Horton. Um, she knew that San Diego was getting a little too big for that library in the upper floors of the city hall. So what she did was uh, she wrote to a man named Andrew Carnegie, and she asked him for fifty thousand dollars to build a to build a new library in San Diego. He wrote her back with a check um, for fifty thousand, and we got the first Carnegie Grant west of the Mississippi. So we moved out of the city hall building, and now um, the Car the Carnegie Building no longer exists. Unfortunately, it was torn down during redevelopment. But now we have our famous East Village Library, uh, about a fifteen minute walk from this old city hall. Across from the city hall is the Cading Building. We nickname it our Love Building. It was built in 1890. It is a Romanesque revival style. Um, the reason we call it our Love Building is because of the man that commissioned it with his wife, um, George and Fanny Cading. Um, so, Mr. Cading, uh, he enjoyed the red brick, the flamboyant red brick um, material for the building but Fanny preferred the gray granite. 
Um, so George knew happy wife, happy life. Um, so he started off with the gray granite, um, but he died before the building was completed. Um, so in honor of her husband, Fanny finished it off with the red brick. It was also, this is a little close up of some of the materials that, was, that were used for the building. Uh, it's now a hotel, but unfortunately it is not open since COVID. So it's, uh, it's uh, empty at the moment. Um, so we also call it our love building because Jim and Ingrid Croce opened their restaurant, Croce's here. Um, Jim and Ingrid moved here in the 1970s and they moved to downtown San Diego. They were looking for a place to have a meal and listen to some wonderful music, just like they did uh, where they lived in the East Coast. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't find anything because during that time, downtown San Diego uh, was not a place that you would venture to. Um, it had a lot of porno theaters, a lot of places of loot. Um, even as a kid in the 1990s, I was not allowed to go uh, visit the gas lamp. Um, so they couldn't find anything that worth worth uh, seeing. And um, Jim and Ingrid um, passed by the Keating building and they said, you know, it would be nice if we could find a place that um, we could welcome people and play live music and have a nice place to eat. Um, so unfortunately, as uh, they didn't see this, this um, dream come to fruition, the next month, Jim went to a gig and um, he boarded a plane to come home and the plane crashed. Um, so Jim Croce passed away. Um, as Ingrid was walking in downtown after he passed away, she saw that this building was up for lease and she decided to open Croce's restaurant here. Um, they were very successful for many years. It was exactly what they had dreamed. It was a place that you could listen to live music and um, get really good food. Their son also played a little bit of live music there as well. And I dug up these photos from many years ago um, when I went to go visit Croce's and it was indeed a wonderful place to listen to music and enjoy um, downtown San Diego. So here we are now, you can see that we went up Fifth Avenue. Uh, we're gonna continue up Fifth Avenue in the gas lamp. Um, I didn't mention that the gas lamp is about uh, 15 and a half blocks um, from, from fourth, fifth and sixth. We are now in the middle, the most historic vein, um, the most historic, historic street in the gas lamp quarter, which is Fifth Avenue. So we're gonna continue going up. This building is the Louis Bank of Commerce built in 1888, and it is nicknamed the Queen of the Gas Lamp Quarter. Um, it's the most photographed building in the Gas Lamp Quarter. Um, as you can see, the architecture is quite beautiful. It is Baroque Revival style. The facade is granite, and a lot of the materials were shipped in from the East Coast. Um, Wyatt Earp frequented this building. Um, it was a historic ice cream parlor and oyster bar. Wyatt Earp was said to favor both of those. Um, but he, uh, another reason that he is said to maybe have frequented the building is because the upper floors were known as the Golden Poppy Hotel. Um, it was in fact a brothel and it was owned by one of San Diego's first female marketing geniuses. Her name was Madame Cora and she was a fortune teller. Um, Madame Cora, when she came to San Diego, she soon realized that people would not want their fortunes told. They wanted to make a fortune. So she knew that they would have money. Um, she also knew that a lot of them probably wouldn't speak English, which was not a problem for her. Um, what Madame Cora did was she would dress all of her employees in one color dress. So one girl would have pink, another one red, blue, yellow, green, so on and so forth. She would parade them up and down Fifth Avenue. If a gentleman was interested um, in a prospective client or if in, in a lady, he would um, tap Madame Cora on the shoulder and point to the girl that he was interested. She would hand him a marble of the same color dress that the girl was wearing. Now during business hours, these gentlemen would make their way up to the upper floors of this building, hand Madame Cora the marble, she would always be known to have a cigar and her feet up on the desk. She would take the marble, point to the room um, that the girl was in. The door was the same color as the marble. You would open the door and there would be the girl in the same color dress. So as you can see, um, no words ever had to be spoken. Um, 
The name comes from Isidore Louis, who commissioned the building along with the Bank of Commerce. So that's where that name comes from. Um, you can see the detail of the building, um, the Baroque sort of influences on it. Um, these are the two towers there. I don't know if anything's in there at the moment. Um, the only business in there now is an architectural firm um, and a nightclub that uses the basement. So we're gonna make our way around the corner. Um, this is the US Grant Hotel and it was commissioned in 1910 by Ulysses S. Grant. Um, his wife and son, actually, that's where the name comes from. Um, I mention it because this is the site of Alonzo Horton's historic hotel. Um, when Alonzo was building a lot of Newtown San Diego, he knew people would pour in and um, want to experience it. So he built a hotel um, for tourists. And so the original hotel that sat where the US grant is was Horton House Hotel. A little fun fact about Horton House Hotel was it is ADA or it was ADA certified, not in the way that we would know um, with you know uh, electricity and all that, but Alonzo Horton um, was very conscious of his patrons and guests that would be disabled. Um, so he fixated everything to accommodate people of all abilities. Down the street is the Balboa Theater. Um, this is in the Spanish Revival architecture. Um, it mirrors the um, train station down the street, and um, it gets its fame because in that era, in that era, the 1920s, people were really obsessed with the Spanish um, Revival architecture. Um, it was a vaudeville theater as well as a silent movie theater. And when they opened in 1924, they um, welcomed numerous, numerous celebrities, as well as um, supposedly what was the most funniest man in the world. Um, I still cannot find his name. So that is a mystery. But he came to San Diego to open the Balboa Theater in the 1920s. And that is a detailed shot. Um, if you're looking from this angle, you could see the Keating building um, in the corner. So we're gonna go down the street to the Golden West Hotel. The Golden West Hotel was built in the early 1900s and um, it was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright's son. Um, and also there was influences from the apprentice of the man that built the uh, Mount Rushmore. So you could see some of the details here. The, little figures in the uppermost corner are supposed to represent workers. So this building was commissioned by John D. Spreckles um, to serve as housing for the people his, that will help build his real estate. It was a place that they could live while they were working and that those uh, figures were supposed to represent them. But a lot of people say that it sort of resembles Elvis Presley. I will let you be the judge of that. Um, so now we are coming down the street to the Ideal Hotel. The Idea, Ideal Hotel um, is still a hotel. It's actually a, um, a uh, gosh, I can't think of the name now. Um, you could still stay there. Uh, it's a hostel, that's the word. Um, it was built in 1912 in anticipation for the Panama Exposition. But what's really special about it is it was um, co-owned by a lady named Anna Brown, who was an African-American lady. She was a very prominent businesswoman um, in that era, the 19, early 1900s in downtown San Diego. This hotel was open specifically for people of color. Um, and it always has been sort of a place where many cultures can come together. Um, it also housed uh, some of, one of the first Chinese restaurants in downtown San Diego. The historic Simmons Hotel um, also has some history with um, the historic African-American um, district in downtown San Diego. Um, it's located kind of off on Sixth Avenue um, but it's worth mentioning because of this history that goes together that these hotels catered to people of color in downtown San Diego. Now we are going to go down the street to one of the most, another most photographed building in the gas lamp. This is the Horton Grand Hotel. It is actually two historic hotels put together. So when people ask me when it was built, I always say the 1880s and the 1980s. We're gonna take a look at the right-hand side. That is the Brooklyn Kale Sadlery Hotel. The Brooklyn Kale Sadlery Hotel um, was sort of a Victorian cowboy hotel. 
And um, it was more of a casual sort of atmosphere. Um, it was a place where you could ride into town and if your horse needed to be taken care of, you could get new hooves, you can get your horse a brush. Um, that is what the bottom floor was used for and the top was um, hotel rooms. Um, Wyatt Earp and his wife Josie lived in this hotel while they were living in San Diego. This is Sunshine. Um, he is in the lobby of the Brooklyn Kale side of the hotel. Um, he is an homage to the old saddlery. Um, his hair is from um, historic police horses. Um, but his body is paper mache, so don't worry, it's not a weird taxidermy statue, um, but the hair is from historic horses of the Victorian era. On the other side is, excuse me, the Grand Hotel. The Grand Hotel um, was the more fancy side of the Horton Grand Hotel, and it was modeled after um, the Innsbruck Inn of um, Austria. The Grand Hotel has some beautiful details. Um, one of the original details of the, or of the Grand side is this beautiful oak staircase. And it spans, I believe, four floors. Um, this is the second floor view of the oak staircase. And here's an overview from the top floor. Um, when so in the 1980s, San Diego experienced um, sort of a redevelopment. And these two buildings, these two historic buildings, the Brooklyn Kale Saddlery and the um, Grand were set to be demolished. Um, people in the city did not like that very much. They wanted to save these buildings. So the city of San Diego made them a deal. They said, I, or we will sell these buildings to whoever for a dollar a piece but you have to move them. So where they're located today is not the original spot to where these two hotels um, stand. Um, they were moved uh, to make way for Horton Plaza and um, newer buildings um, in San Diego. Um, the man that bought it, Dan Pearson, he did buy them for a dollar a piece, but he had nowhere to put them. So what he did was he disassembled the two buildings brick by brick and he stored each of the pieces in a storehouse all over San Diego. So they were all over the place. Um, when the plot of land became available um, in the late 18, or I'm sorry, the late 1980s, he erected both of the buildings piece by piece. It's said that each of the blocks were numbered um, and he erected the building piece by piece, side by side to where they are now. Um, and he built an atrium in the middle to connect the two buildings. So that's why when people ask me um, what year it was built or if the era it was built, I always give them the two different uh, dates. So now I'm gonna give you sort of a sense of where we are in the gas lamp. Um, we made our way all the way around. Um, if you can see where one of the red dots are, it says Horton Plaza Park. Um, and the Grant Hotel, we made our way all the way down fourth. Um, the Horton Grand Hotel is right across from the Gas Lamp Museum. Um, so that is um, sort of where I will leave you um, for the tour um, if we were doing this in person. You just covered, um, if we were doing this in person, you just covered about a mile of walking, maybe a little more. Um, of all the historic blocks in the gas lamp quarter. Um, so what I would do is I would leave you here at the Salt and Whiskey, which is my favorite place um, in the Horton Grand Hotel to sort of decompress from a tour. Um, they, what I love about it is the historic atmosphere. Um, also, for people who are interested, it is rumored to be haunted. Um, a lot of the buildings that we talked about um, might have a little bit of haunted history. Keep in mind that um, the area was also a red light district. So with all the craziness that comes with that um, are also some a few ghost stories. Um, at the Horton Grand, so we're sitting in the Salt and Whiskey, and this is probably where I would tell you some of the ghostly tales of this building. Um, it is said to be haunted by a gambler um, who was cheating at a game of cards and when he was being pursued, he ran up to room 30, 
302 or 305. I, I have to check, check my sources on that. But he ran up to a room on the third floor and hid in the armoire. He was found, of course, and he was shot on sight. And so he is said to haunt that building. Um, there are other apparitions that people sort of say make house in that building. Um, they say Ida Bailey, another prominent madam of the era, era was said to haunt the building. Um, as a historian, I don't know how true that would be. Um, Miss Ida Bailey's Canary Cottage was located down the street from where the Horton Grand Theater now sits. Um, Ida Bailey catered to more of the prominent um, citizens of San Diego and um, hers was a more high-end brothel, but it wasn't on that plot of land. But they do say that Ida Bailey is one of the ghosts that haunt um, this uh, salt and whiskey or this uh, Horton Grand Hotel. So as we would enjoy some of their historically themed drinks, we would also talk about those ghostly tales and if you experienced anything. Um, if that is not your thing, if you are more into the lounges, I would direct you to um, some of our famous rooftop bars. And that way you could sort of take in a view of the city um, after a tour. And this one happens to be overlooking um, or Petco Park, but there's tons in the gas lamp also all over San Diego. Um, and that maybe could be where you would choose to decompress from a tour and all the walking that we just did. Um, it is also baseball season. So um, a lot of people, when they come on the tours, they head over down to um, Petco Park, which is within walking distance, um, and they take in a game. So after a tour, I would direct you down to Balboa Park where you can enjoy the Padres um, beating whatever team comes into our stadium. Um, also, that is a place that you could find some local cuisines. What's great about Petco Park is they have a lot of um, flagship San Diego restaurants. Um, they have a barbecue place called Phil's, which I really love. The line is always long there. Um, and they also have some of our famous Mexican joints and um, numerous ones. I think they're sort of changing every time, but um, if that is what you would do after a tour, I would direct you down there to our ballpark. Um, of course, the gas lamp quarter is known for being the nightlife center in San Diego. So if you would wait till nightfall, um, the city or the downtown sort of takes on this completely different air um, when the moon is shining um, and stars are over our beautiful historic downtown. Um, for me, I'm off work usually about five o'clock. That's when I leave. Um, as I walk towards my car, you can feel the air of downtown San Diego shift from sort of a quiet, uh, bustling downtown, um, lots of deliveries, lots of people walking around eating um, or taking in some of the sites. Um, and it sort of changes to this really fast paced um, club atmosphere um, in downtown San Diego. So that is where I would direct you as well if you were into the nightlife. Hopefully you would have more of an appreciation now that we went through this tour of all the buildings that house some of these nightclubs that you could party in the basement of. Um, one question that I get um, at the end of the tour is why it's called the Gas Lamp Quarter. So it is called the Gas Lamp Quarter. That name comes from the 1980s during the redevelopment. Um, so historically it was called Newtown. Um, and then it was called, nicknamed the Stingery um, for the red light district. And then um, when the area was revitalized in the 1980s, they were trying to think of a name. Um, they wanted to call it the Gaslight District. Uh, I heard that that was taken. So they decided to go with the gas lamp um, quarter, um, sort of modeled after the French quarter. A lot of people, when they visit um, San Diego, they say that the downtown area reminds them of the French Quarter because of all the historic buildings in it. Um, so that's where that name comes from. The bulbs that you see, so those are electric um, gas lamps and those sort of line the district and that's how you know you are in the historic portion of the gas lamp. Um, once you don't see bulbs that look like this, 
um, you are probably in East Village, um, which is the neighboring part of the neighborhood, or you are in the Marina District, which is closer to the Bay, um, or you are in the Asian Thematic District, which is a, our closest neighbor um, in the district. Um, we went over quite a few buildings on this tour, um, but there's no way that we could go over all of them because we would be here for hours and hours. There are nearly 100 historic buildings in the gas lamp quarter alone, not to mention throughout San Diego. Um, so if you're looking for historic hist or history and architecture, we are definitely a destination um, that you could enjoy for that purpose. Um, if we missed any and you, are, you happen to be walking in the district and you see one that we didn't go over, all you would have to do is look for um, one of these plaques, one of these gold and brown plaques, let's say historic building, that will give you a little bit um, of history of the building if it is designated historic. So don't worry, um, you will get to find out anything you want about the historic buildings. Also, our historian writes um, about each of the buildings in detail. So anything you wanna know about it, you can just kind of consult that as well. Um, well, that is going to end our tour um, after, after all that. Um, I'm going to leave you guys under the historic arch, which um, claims this district as the historic heart of San Diego. This is where a lot of people like to take their photos. Um, it is on Fifth Avenue, um, opposite of where we were walking. So you would have to double back the other way if you wanted to get a photo of this. Um, it's beautiful at night. So after our tour, I would suggest you go there and take the city in at night um, and get all of your photos during that time as well. And that will conclude my tour of the historic gas line quarter. That's awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much. I'm going to share um, a slide that you shared with me. And this is something that really resonates with me in San Diego. And it's not the buildings. It's not the foreground. It's the background. That sky is the sky you see 24 seven every day, it seems in San Diego. And it's just so unusual to see that in a, I, I really, I mean, that's what struck me about the region of, of where you live is that every day you wake up and you see clear blue skies, it's almost like a painting and not a reality. Um, so I, I, you probably take that for granted, but it's so unusual for most of us in any other part of the world. Um, um, it's really heard. interesting, obviously the historic part of it, very interesting. I just, um, I just wanted to, share that with everybody because I know that you know that's something that you 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 just don't it, it's stunning it, it's absolutely stunning I so was gonna, now, oh, oh sorry Mary I was just gonna add that we we talked about that and um you're totally right it's something that I don't think about as a person that has lived here a long time what we get excited about you can tell a true San Diegan is when it rains all of us just stop what we're doing and look out the window <laughs> so it's like snow for some right <clears throat> well that beautiful blue sky is is just an amazing treat um so now is our time to go to the Q&A um as everybody will see and if you missed my introduction Jamie has graciously decided to donate all of the tips that are left um, for donations and they will all go to the Gas Lamp Quarter Historical Foundation. So if you are gonna leave a tip today, please know that she is just gonna donate that right back to the nonprofit that she works for. Um, so I encourage those tips to come in through Venmo, PayPal. Uh, my website has a secure credit card um, mechanism and um, so please know that we're gonna go to Q&A now. Um, Jamie, if you wanna take a minute to look at some of the, Q, uh, the, the, the cues, some of the questions that have filtered in, we can go through them. Um, so uh, we'll start right at the top. And the first question is from Robin, does San Diego experience earthquakes as frequently as Northern California and um, LA and San Francisco do? Uh, yes, actually, we just had one recently, um, and uh, I didn't feel it. Uh, that's another thing about being a San Diegan is 
sometimes you miss earthquakes entirely. Um, it's just something that goes with living here. There's actually a, an earth or a, a vein, uh, I forget the name, a fault in, in downtown San Diego called Fault Line Park. Um, but we have had more earthquakes recently um, sort of out of San Diego, but last week I believe we had one that was closer to us. Does it um, ever not, affect the historic buildings or is there any, you know, is there any um, effects on, on any of those historic buildings? Um, nothing recently. I do know that um, back in the past, some of them were destroyed by earthquakes. Um, but as far as from the museum and that perspective, nobody has complained about any damage to their buildings. Um, if I can mention something that does uh, affect us, it's floods when those rains do come in. Earthquakes, not so much, but the flooding, um, that has damaged some buildings in, in some historic buildings in San Diego. Oh, wow, you wouldn't expect that. Um, the gas lamps, we'll talk about them a little bit. They're electric, I would imagine, at this point, right? Did, yes. Was it very common for gas lamps um, in, in history in this area? I would assume that's why it was, was named that. But um, were they lit every night? Like, was it a very, you know, talk to us a little bit about where this name came from and how it came about. Sure. Um, historically, what I was told um, is that there weren't too many gas lamps um, in, the, in the 1800s. There were a few, because um, that's how you would light a district um, and they would be lit every night. Um, but the name just comes from the 1980s um, when they were trying to revitalize and name the district. Um, they added those gas lamps. Um, and so those are all electrified. Um, and that's, that. the name is very recent. Um, so- You said 1990s, right? 1980s. Oh, 1980s, okay. Yeah. Um, so here's a question that I almost asked you earlier. So I'll, I'll reiterate for everybody else. Like we think of Coronado as an island and one of the, one of the participants asked, are there passenger ferries to Coronado Island? Why don't you um, enlighten everyone as you did with me earlier when I was talking about Coronado Island? Sure. <laughs> so um, Coronado is actually a peninsula, but we all we all call it Coronado Island. Um, but yes, there are ferries. Um, there's a ferry you can take, which actually is is a great way to spend the afternoon. I believe the last time I went out, the, the tickets were ten dollars round trip. And you could board from downtown San Diego. It takes you across the bay into um, the ferry landing of Coronado where you can spend the afternoon and get coffee or just kind of look out at the bay. But the ride in itself gives you these beautiful views of the, bay, of, um, the San Diego skyline. So definitely recommend to add that to your itinerary. Great. A uh, question about your tours, um, are the tours from the foundation usually architectural of the buildings or more historical or a combination of both? Um, great question. So they're a combination of both. Um, our historian and a lot of our volunteer tour guides um, are very well versed in architecture. Um, a lot of them have been there longer than me. Um, I personally am more into the history and stories. And I always tell people, I apologize that um, I am not super versed on architecture. I just know what the historian has told me. Um, so if you do take a tour, all the tours are gonna be a little bit different. The basis are gonna be there, but depending on who your tour guide is, you'll get more architectural, you'll get a little more fun stories, you'll get a little more ghostly tales. Um, no tour is completely the same. Do they have some tours of the local establishments like microbrewery tours and things of that nature? Yes, um, tons of tours you could take in San Diego. Um, we don't do them. We focus mostly on the history, um, but you can take microbrewery tours. You could take food tours, um, beach tours. Uh, there's a old, the Old Town Trolley will actually take you to all of the prominent spots. So if you don't have transportation, um, which I forgot to mention, Mara, you told me to mention this is um, San Diego is not walkable. Um, it is very much a car city, but if you happen to be in a certain neighborhood, like the Gas Lamp or um, Coronado or Old Town, you can walk around those areas pretty easily, but you need to get to them first. 
Mm -hmm. um, so my suggestion for a tour is to hop on the Old Town Trolley Tour. That'll give you a ride to each of these different places and then you can walk around on foot there. Yeah, that's exactly how I got around when I was there. Um, a question about the revitalization of one of the audience participants said she worked there in the late 80s, um, doesn't remember when this was complete. It's really looking so much more beautiful than she recalls. When was the rev uh, revitalization completed? Um, well, I like to say it's kind of ongoing, to be honest. Um, it started in the, in the late 70s, um, went into the 90s. Um, is when I guess you could say it was complete because Horton Plaza was complete and all of these buildings were sort of springing up and people started flooding into downtown um, during that time. The early 2000s, I would say, is the peak. Um, when COVID hit, we have not quite reached that same pinnacle. Um, we're starting to build up to it, um, but we do have a lot of sort of things going on in downtown. Um, homelessness is a really big issue. Um, it's just part of the fabric of downtown now. Um, so we have not quite reached that pinnacle as it was in the early 2000s, I would say. So it's kind of ongoing. Mm -hmm. your, your tours, do they encompass ghost tours in the evening? Is that one of the things that you do since you have so many ghost stories? Yes, um, yes. My wonderful friend, our historian, um, is our resident ghost lady. And so she has many tales to tell. Um, and she was also part of San Diego Ghost Hunters. Um, so if you, if you are in downtown, a lot of people will be doing ghost tours, but our tour well, is the only one that'll let you inside the oldest, most haunted building in the gas lamp. A mm -hmm. um, couple food questions. What was the Mexican, um, what was the name of the Mexican restaurant in the Barrio Logan? And then also there was a question about afternoon teas or something of that nature. I don't think you mentioned that, but you can comment on both of those. Sure. Um, so it's called Cuatro Milpas. I think it means four corn stalks or cornfields. <laughs> uh, I could be wrong on Spanish is, is not, uh, I don't know too well, but um, Cuatro Milpas in Barrio Logan is very famous. Um, and I mentioned that I haven't been there myself because the line is always out the door. There's never a time where it's not busy. Um, and it's a very famous historic restaurant. I believe it's, it's still owned by the Estadio family, uh, which is a prominent historical family from San Diego. Um, and you can find homemade tortillas, uh, oh, it's, the smells coming from there is, is wonderful. So put that on your itinerary and try to get there early. Um, is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, the afternoon teas. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple places you can go. There in Julian is my, Julian's my favorite place in San Diego. It's up in the mountains. Um, they have a Julian tea house there next to the bookshop. Um, there's also a place in Old Town. Um, I don't know if they have opened post COVID but it's in a historic um, Victorian building. And um, a, a really popular place is Shakespeare's, which is in the middle of the city. It's uh, an authentic English um, afternoon tea. And also the Horton brand used to do teas and they might bring that back. So there's, there's numerous places you can enjoy um, afternoon tea in San Diego. Speaking of Shakespeare, Kathy has asked, does the Old Globe Theater still put on plays? They do, yes, they do. Um, I haven't seen the Shakespeare Festival come back yet. I may have missed it, um, but they do still have plays. I want to say the last one that was there a few months ago, which has probably changed now, but um, it was Hairspray. Mm. So they, had a, they have a variety of plays that they do. Yeah, I don't recall Shakespeare doing Hairspray, huh? <laughs> 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 he may have been in it once, but I don't know. Um, so that was the last of your questions. There's one question here for me that I'll answer. And it said, I did enjoy this very much. So thank you, Jamie, very much. I hope these virtual tours continue. I look forward to them very much. We will be continuing virtual tours. There will be some dips when it's high travel season because we don't have the access to the guides because they're out on the road. 
um, as well as I will be out as well. But we will continue to bring back more and more virtual tours. So just keep an eye out um, and sign up for the email newsletter if you need to by going to my website, girltraveltours.com. And then you'll always um, be notified when the next tour comes. So I want to thank you, Jamie, for bringing your spin on the gas lamp um, quarters to us. And um, thank you so much for bringing the other side of the country to light for me. Um, and thank you everybody who came tonight. Uh, I appreciate your attendance as always. And we will see you in a couple weeks to go to Madrid. Thanks again, Jamie. I'll see you soon. Thank Bye -bye. you all so much.